Hello and welcome to World Connect, your weekly window to the world, a global picture of our times. Let's set the ball rolling with the focus of the show. Just four weeks left for the US presidential election and the GOP, which has been out of power for eight years, is in disarray. Its nominee Donald Trump's crass comments leave the party feeling devoid of class. Master lyricist and songwriter Bob Dylan redefines literary tradition. By winning the Nobel Prize for Literature, the world recognizes his songs are poetry to the years. Thailand mourns the passing of a king whose majesty reigned for 70 long years. King Bhumibol the Great was the ninth Rama of the Chakri dynasty. Boko Haram frees 21 of more than 200 Chibok schoolgirls kidnapped more than two years ago. Local sources say the girls were exchanged for four Boko Haram militants. The Nigerian government denies it was a swamp. Facing a series of charges of sexual assault, Donald Trump has turned combative and defiant. He claims he's the victim of a conspiracy and even says that the very survival of the U.S. is at stake. But the fact remains that with just four weeks left for polling day, Trump is down in the dumps as far as pre-poll surveys are concerned. The grand old Republican Party he represents, which stands for conservative values, is distancing themselves from his crass comments. Donald Trump has fallen further behind Hillary Clinton and now trails her by eight points among likely voters, according to recent polls after the second presidential debate which took place on Sunday. One in five Republicans also say his vulgar comments about groping women disqualify him from the presidency. Trump was pressed to explain his comments in a 2005 videotape about grabbing women's genitalia. And after he apologized to the American people, a number of women are now coming out saying that he misbehaved with them as well. The Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton has said that her rival Donald Trump's campaign has very different vision, views and sets of values. But the voices against Trump's inappropriate behavior and his consequent weak set of skill sets for the US presidency have been growing louder. And one of the loudest voices comes from the incumbent president Barack Obama. The 2005 video showed Trump bragging about groping women, kissing them without permission and trying to seduce a married woman which he described as locker room talk. But the video has threatened Republican hopes of retaining control of the US Congress and has deeply split the grand old party with many of its members abandoning support for Trump. Hurricane Matthew, the first category five Atlantic hurricane in a while and the second major hurricane this year caused massive devastation across the Western Atlantic, including Haiti, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Southwestern United States and Canadian Maritimes. Most of the over 1,300 people killed died in Haiti, and damages are estimated in excess of $5.2 billion. As Haiti reels under the aftermath of the horrific Hurricane Matthew, the government, along with international aid, aims to rehabilitate the Caribbean country. New images of destruction and debris emerged a week after the hurricane hit Haiti. Thousands of families have lost their homes and livelihoods as floodwaters destroyed crops. The fear of famine also looms large over the country. We don't have exact figures, but it looks as if, you know, between 60 and 80 percent of the crops have, have been lost. And I think what is actually, this is devastating. and It basically could mean that we would have a, a famine in six months because the entire food supply for the coming six months is at stake. Haiti's government is coordinating aid efforts six years after an earthquake measuring seven on the Richter scale leveled much of the nation's capital, Port-au-Prince. Officials first focused on making accessibility possible to many areas cut off after the storm because of flooding, landslides, down trees and debris. We must put them back to work, we must rehabilitate our roads, we must rehabilitate our bridges, we must readapt our schools. The international community is also pitching in for the rehabilitation efforts in Haiti. United States, Canada, Colombia, Cuba, France, Spain and the European Union are among others who have offered aid to the hurricane-ravaged country. 
Several steps are being taken to contain outbreaks of cholera and other epidemics which have broken out as a result of the inundations and mixing up of sewage water with flood waters. Along with food and water, medicine and mosquito nets are also part of the aid kits brought into the country. Even as the government is taking steps to ensure access of sterile and bottled water to all, the World Health Organization sends 1 million cholera vaccine doses. The United Nations, while appealing for more international aid to the country, has also slammed the government and international authorities for preventing to fail the hundreds of deaths caused due to the hurricane. I find it truly outrageous and unacceptable that we can have a, a country like Haiti uh, in which we've had those of us outside of Haiti are watching on TV even days before this uh, this storm hit and that it was impossible to reach people with early warning or the early warning that was provided because of lack of training and, uh, and community education was not acted on. This is a matter of grave concern which the world leaders will have to pay close attention to. Even as technology improves for predicting extreme weather condition, poor countries like Haiti find it difficult to reduce the impact on human lives. Thousands of Colombians wearing white and carrying flowers marched through Bogota on Wednesday. They were demanding that politicians revive a peace accord that would end a five-decade-long war after voters had rejected the hard-fought deal in a referendum. Showing support for the agreement inked last month by President Juan Manuel Santos and the head of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, Rodrigo Londono, the throng of students, farmers and indigenous leaders congregated at Plaza Bolivar in front of the Congress. The demonstration took place as Santos and his team heard proposals from representatives of those who voted against the accord as too lenient on the rebels. Londono had earlier said he is confident the deal can be revived and there would be good news soon. Venezuela's Supreme Court has allowed President Nicolas Maduro to put forth the country's 2017 budget without going through the opposition-led National Assembly, breaking a constitutional obligation. Venezuela is wrestling with a deep economic crisis that has food running short and inflation in triple digits. The opposition accuses the leftist government of undermining the legislature to strengthen its grip on power. The court based its decision on the need to complete the legal formation of the national budget with the aim of maintaining the state's functions, guaranteeing fundamental rights and constitutional order. His legion of fans who have been demanding that Bob Dylan be given the Nobel Prize for Literature since 1996 will no doubt be happy that their wish has finally come true. His fans go beyond his folk rock music and they admire the mystery in his lyrics, which are captivating, transporting one into moments of wonder, with each word in place, what the Nobel Committee described as poetry to the ear. There's a battle outside and it's raging. It'll soon shake your windows and rattle your walls, for the times, they are a-changing. The times are really changing indeed. The Nobel Prize for Literature 2016 has just proved it, as the famed annual award was accorded to American music legend Bob Dylan. The Nobel Prize in Literature for 2016 is awarded to Bob Dylan for having created new poetic expressions within the great American song tradition. Born Robert Allen Zimmerman in 1941, Dylan has been an influential figure in popular music for more than five decades. One of the best-selling artists of all time, Dylan has been the recipient of 11 Grammy Awards, including the Lifetime Achievement Award, the Oscar, the Pulitzer, among others. His songs in the 60s also became anthems for social and civil rights movements, donning multiple caps that of a singer-songwriter, artist and writer. His poetic lines found way to the public as many hummed his heartfelt renditions reflecting the common man's daily travails. The music icon's genius lies in the timeless lyrics he pens, ones that will be read for years to come, yet. His famous song, Like a Rolling Stone, has been judged as one of the best songs for all times. Yeah. 
How does it feel to be on your own, with no direction home, like a complete unknown, like a rolling stone? As they relate to the individual in different life situations, his chimes of freedom performed in 1964 still holds firm as thousands around the world are fighting for equality and justice. Chimes of freedom flashing. Though there are contradictions on whether lyrics can be considered literature, many are excited that the writer of the lyrics they have always treasured has been given an official recognition fit for great writers. The 8th BRICS Summit and the first ever BRICS BIMSTEC meet are taking place in Goa. India is currently the chair of BRICS and Prime Minister Narendra Modi welcomed the BRICS leaders Michel Temer, Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping and Jacob Zuma to Goa where the five economic engines are looking for ways to improve the place of emerging economies in the world. In the run-up, India also hosted the first BRICS film festival and the BRICS Under-17 football tournament. BRICS also agreed on setting up a joint working group on environment-related issues. Agriculture ministers of BRICS nations had also met in New Delhi and New Delhi hosted the first BRICS trade fair. The Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multisectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation, BIMSTEC, it has Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Myanmar, Nepal, Sri Lanka and Thailand and the first ever BRICS BIMSTEC meeting will be held on October 16. It comes at a time when pressure is building up on Pakistan after the 19th SARC summit scheduled in Islamabad was cancelled. The U.S. military launched cruise missile strikes on Thursday, hitting three coastal radar sites in Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen. Now, these were retaliatory measures after a failed missile attack on a U.S. naval destroyer earlier in the week. Well, the Yemeni forces, they say that the strikes are not acceptable and they've denied that the Iran-aligned Houthi forces had carried out any missile attacks on a U.S. warship. The 18-month-old war in Yemen escalated this week even as reports of cholera outbreak surfaced in the country. Over 10,000 people, mostly civilians, have been killed and millions displaced since the start of the civil war. President Abdirabu Mansour Hadi, backed by Saudi Arabia, is still operating from Aden, a southern city. Along with the aid of Riyadh's forces, Hadi aims to take back capital Sana'a. That is now ruled by Houthi rebels who claim that they have led a national revolt against a corrupt government. A surge in tensions occurred after a strike on a Sana morning hall on the 8th of October killed at least 140 people and injured more than 500, most of whom were civilians. Riyadh has not accepted responsibility for the airstrike and has ordered an investigation on how the funeral hall was hit as international outcry mounted against one of the deadliest incidents during the war. Last week, a U.S. Navy destroyer was targeted in a failed missile attack from territory in Yemen controlled by the Houthis, following which the U.S. military launched cruise missile strikes to knock out three coastal radar sites. This is Washington's first direct military action against suspected Houthi-controlled targets in Yemen's conflict. The U.S., however, played down the attack, saying it was a retaliation and not connected to the broader conflict. Warning against any more escalation of violence, UN Chief Ban Ki-moon has said that there must be accountability for the appalling conduct of the war in Yemen. The World Health Organization, meanwhile, has called for more humanitarian and medical aids to Yemen after confirming 11 cases of cholera. However, they have said there is no spread of the disease. The WHO has also taken steps together with its partners on the ground to curb the outbreak, testing water and sanitation in the suspected area. They have ensured specialty treatment kits in the hospital. The world's longest reigning monarch, King Bhumi Ball of Thailand, died on Thursday after 70 years on the throne. The government has announced a one-year mourning period and also declared a 30-day moratorium on state and official events. Well, the Thai king goes by the title of Rama and he was Rama the Ninth. World's longest serving monarch, King Bhumibol Adulyadej of Thailand, passed away on 13th October. He was 88. The king, who took charge in June 1946, was looked upon as father figure who guided the nation through decades of change and turmoil in the Southeast Asian nation. 
Thais plunged into grief as most of them wore black to mourn his death and thousands gathered at Bangkok's Grand Palace. Thailand Prime Minister Prayut Chanocha said the country was in immeasurable grief, profound sorrow and bereavement. Leaders from around the world expressed condolence. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said King Bhumibol was revered by the people of Thailand as a unifying national leader. Australia's Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull said King Bhumibol has reigned in Thailand for 70 years. During the time, there has been extraordinary economic and social progress. The monarch has often stepped in to calm crisis on several occasions during his reign. The military, which has now taken over reigns in Thailand after a political crisis, invoked its duty to defend the monarchy to justify its intervention in politics. Thailand has endured bomb attacks and economic worries recently. After a decade of turmoil, including two coups and deadly protests, the country is expected to go to the polls next year. A time when King Bhumibol will surely be missed. Many Thais worry about a future without him. Crown Prince Mahavajiralong Khan is expected to be the new king. However, the prince does not command the same adoration that his father earned over a lifetime on the throne. In Nigeria, 21 of the over 200 girls kidnapped by Boko Haram terrorists in 2014 in the northern town of Chibok have been released. A presidency statement said the release of the girls is the outcome of negotiations between the administration and Boko Haram brokered by the International Red Cross and the Swiss government. While well, the government has said that negotiations to release the other girls will continue. The government, however, has denied reports that it had swapped Boko Haram fighters for their release and has sworn that army operations against the militants will continue. Around 270 girls were taken from their school in Chibok in April of 2014. Dozens escaped initially, but more than 200 are still missing. Police and judicial officers in the German state of Saxony faced a blaze of criticism after a Syrian man suspected of plotting to bomb a Berlin airport killed himself in a detention center where he had been deemed not at risk of suicide. The 22-year-old Jabbar al-Bakr, who evaded police on Saturday and sparked a two-day manhunt before being turned in by fellow Syrians, hanged himself in his cell on Wednesday evening with his T-shirt. Saxony's state premier said on Friday improvements in Saxony's correctional system are to come after the suicide of the bomb plotter in jail. Brexit woes continue to hit the UK as Scotland prepares to publish a fresh independence referendum bill for consultation next week. According to the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, it is part of a strategy to ensure that Scotland's voice is heard in the negotiations to take Britain out of the European Union. She told delegates at her Scottish National Party conference that there is no rational case for taking the UK out of the single market and there is no authority for it either. The Scots rejected independence in the 2014 referendum by 45 is to 55 percent. In the Brexit referendum held in June, however, Scotland voted to keep its EU membership, but it faces leaving the EU because the United Kingdom as a whole has voted to leave. Let's now take a look at some other events that are making news across the world. At a time when smartphones and laptops consume most of our time, traditional games, which kept many of us happy as children, are definitely on the wane. 
And in order to protect these traditions and revive interest in the old sports, Indonesian families are being encouraged to teach their children the joy of playing old games at traditional games festivals. With lots of video games to choose from and less of going out in the open to play, children of recent times have become pros with video games. But in Indonesia, there has been a recent stand against digital games, which according to the citizens are eroding traditional values. So in order to reintroduce these games to the young kids, a traditional games festival is being held to make them interested in these age-old games. We want to reintroduce traditional games to the children so that they know there are other options available that are not just restricted to video games or other modern games and a lot of traditional games can be quite fun and interesting. The children born in the digital age took up traditional toys ranging from wooden spinning tops to bamboo pinwheels as part of the traditional games festival. Many of these games have now become a rarity in the country and are difficult to find. Experts believe that these games will instill in them a sense of team spirit. As parents and teachers are worried that children get warped in the virtual world, they believe that traditional games will also create more opportunities for interacting with peers in the real world. Theatre is one of the oldest forms of artistic expression. It deals as easily with poignant themes as it does with comedy or satire. It holds the public square enthralled with themes that also include music and dance. Well, one of the famous genres is theatre of the absurd that deals with situations that show life has no purpose. But an Egyptian playwright now presents the theatre of the unheard. Egyptian playwright Mohammed Alam uses his talent for drama for a purpose. He has written a special play to bring to attention the plight of five million people with hearing impairment in Egypt. As an art of entertainment, Alam intends to mirror the society with his plays. Those with hearing disability are either ignored or pitted upon in theater. In an effort to bring about a more inclusive portrayal of these people, Alam has spent perfume. One time I was walking down the street and I saw this guy talking through a video call and using a strange hand language. I then found out that this is an actual language and that's what they used to communicate since they can't talk or hear well. The play is in sign language and voice narration. Ten comedic and dramatic sketches focused on the problems faced by those who cannot hear. The medley includes musical numbers, video story, tap dancing. It also includes a skit about an alternate universe where the majority were people with hearing disability. With two groups of actors on stage, one perform the drama by speaking while the other do the action by singing. The performers include a group of seven young people who have hearing and speaking impairments, in addition to five other professional actors. Mohammed Alam, through the play, does not only aim to bring out challenges faced by them, but also wants to make them an innate part of Egyptian theatre. And with that, we wind up this edition of World Connect. Do send us your feedback. Our email ID is worldconnect.ddnews at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at WorldConnectDD, or you can also follow us on Facebook. But before we go, we leave you with these images of the Berlin Festival of Lights. Now in October, Berlin transforms itself into a city of lights with all its major landmarks lit up. Thanks very much for watching. Namaskar.